I'm wondering if you're actually in my ear monitors, but I don't think you are, so I'll undo them. Um, what, I, what I want would like to say is that this is this speech thing that I'm supposed to give now has been has been following me down to the sound of its voice will haunt me for the last two weeks. It's not hard for me to go and play for you, but it's very hard for me to try to tell you how how I thank you for for this, for this being the first girl in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Sometimes I just can tell great stories because it's like, it's easy. If, I, if I'm telling a story about Prince, I can say he picked me up in his purple Camaro and we went out to his purple house in a suburb outside of Minneapolis and nobody knew where I was. And we wrote a song and he called it, They'll take her, It'll Take You Days to Find Her. And I can actually tell you a great story about that because it is what it is. But for me to tell you a story from my heart about what this means to me is very hard because this has never happened to me before. And I'm hoping that since it never happened to me, and now only once, 22 men in for zero women, and now one woman, that what I am doing is open the door. For other women to go like, hey man, I can do it. And I'm telling all my friends that like the girls in high, I'm going, okay you guys, you gotta really get together now. And like one of you needs to step away, and don't break up your band. Just do an album so you have it, because it's gonna take 20 years. <laughs> Or you will be recognized as, as, again, so you'll already be like 60. So you have to do it right now. So it's like, this is the problem of getting in. I was, um, I, I started Belladonna in 19, really thinking about it in 1979. So I'd only been to Fleetwood Mac for not quite four years, really only like maybe more like three and a half years. And so this is a hard thing to do because you have to, it, the times are different, and it's like, I don't, it's going to be hard. But I know there's somebody out there that will be able to do it, because I'm going to give you all the directions, and I'll do enough interviews to say exactly what to do. <laughs> and I want to tell you that everybody in my life gave me ideas of what I could say to you. Like, this is from, and I have to just say this, because I don't have my glasses on, I can't even read it. But I've read it so many times, in the middle of the night, crying, going like, I don't know about it idea what I'm gonna say. <laughs> and this morning at 4.30 my assistant came in and I'm laying there and my little Chinese crab that is like laying, she lays right on my stomach and she's looking at me like, it's so late. And I said, and she goes, like, are you done? And I'm going, no, I can't do it. I have to go to bed. I, I don't know what I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna have to go out there and go like, you know what? Six minutes is not very long. So let me move right on. And Six minutes for me. I majored in speech communication at San Jose State and psychology. Five. And the second I called my mom and said, I have to quit because me and Lindsay have to move to LA because the music is in San Francisco, but the record deals are in LA. We have to go tomorrow. And my mom said, okay, that's fine, but we will be withdrawing all financial support. <laughs> and I said, flat out, I know mom. I know, and I'm up to the challenge. Three waitress jobs, two cleaning lady jobs. It was cool. Lindsay worked on the music. I worked on the and I'm very happy. <laughs> and I rather enjoyed it because I could get out of the house and go into the real world instead of just being in the cave with all the guys who were just laying around smoking pot and messing up my house. So it's like I go, excuse me, Excuse me, can I just step over your feet and your pot and everything so I can straighten this place up? And I don't get paid for doing this at my own house, but I will do it for you because I know you guys work hard. So that's, that's a little bit of a moment of how we got before Fleetwood Mac. Okay, so I want to tell you that this solo album thing, I started thinking about this, and I only know this because my friend Paul Fishkin in 1976, who then became my boyfriend after we went to this convention at the Acapulco Princess, which I like to call the tequila convention, because <laughs> the first night, everybody had the little necklaces. You, one of you here may have been there. The little necklaces across, around your, your neck, and they come and they fill it with tequila, and who's gonna waste tequila? So it's like, <laughs> So everybody was so drunk that nobody surfaced for three solid days and then it was over. So everybody just went to the airport and left. But not me. I stayed 
I stay because I'm going like, I'm already down here, somebody else paid for it, so I'm gonna enjoy this vacation. So Paul and me, I said to him, after playing Rumors, which was not even finished, but still really cool, the night before, I didn't ever hear it because I passed out as soon as I pushed play. But some people must have heard it because they spoke about it later. Um, so I said, no, no, it's new songs, it's other songs, it's, you know, more demos. And he goes, like, it's okay. So we go on the beach and I play him probably 15 or 20 songs and he goes, wow, that's a lot of songs. <laughs> okay. And he's a record man, right? So we go back to LA and New York, we start going out. And I find out, because Paul tells me, that and a year later when I said to him, <clears throat> do you think there's any way that I could do a Make Discreet solo album <laughs> that would not break up Fleetwood Mac? Like, and I'm going like, it's a secret. <laughs> and he's, he's like, I think so. I think if you're kind and loving and you tell them that you will always put them first and they will always be at the top of your priority list, they will understand and they will say, go do what you want to do and have fun. We'll see you in the end. So that's what we eventually did. And yes, my amazing band is still together and very strong today. Last but not least, which probably won't be last but not least, they can't get me off this stage now that I'm on it. I want to thank, first of all, very quickly, Paul Fishkin, because he is, was the wise man who said, you can do both and you can, you can have both, you just have to do it with love. That's all. Then I was introduced to his partner, Danny Goldberg, who became Paul's and my, our guru and our, our, our calm coach who kept us calm. I was gone all the time, so they were like talking about this and trying to put it together calmly and serenely. And so I'm, I'm off in the world doing rumors and tusk, and they're working behind the scenes to see if they can make this happen. And then it happened, we formed a record deal, I mean a record company called Modern. We went to Mr. Doug Morris at Atlantic, my hero, and um, I said, so Doug, and this is me, so Doug, what I want to do is I want to make a Tom Petty album, straight up rock and roll, and I, I have two great girl singers, Lori and Sharon, that are amazing, and we're going to be Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I'm going to be Stills, and they're going to be Nash and Crosby. So we're going to be straight up rock and roll, but we're going to sound like Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And Doug's like, and fucking tastic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to swear, but... So then I said, so, who, so who, produced, uh, who produces Tom Petty? He goes, Jimmy Iovine. And I'm going like, so can you set me up with Jimmy Iovine? And he goes, yeah, I, oh, I can. So he says, I'll give him a call. So he calls Jimmy and, and he sets us up to go and have dinner. So we go and have dinner and I tell him the same thing. Tom Petty, straight up rock album, but we want to sound like Crosby, Susan Nash. And he goes like, okay, I can do it. I haven't done a girl album in a while. So we go, okay, good. We both went back to LA because he was there working on Tom's, finishing Tom's record. So we get there, 10 days later, I moved in with Jimmy. <laughs> it's just how it was. <laughs> so, I moved in with Jimmy, I learned to make tiny pizza, tiny pizzas, and waited for him to finish the album, Tom's album. Meanwhile, me and Lori and Sharon are practicing all our three-part harmonies, which Jimmy and nobody else really wanted to hear. So we were going to be damned if we weren't going to be on that album being Crosby, Sills, and Nash. So we got so good during that next six weeks that when he was done and we started Belladonna, we were ready. So we walked in and we made an album in three months, which is unheard of, especially in those days. We were focused. We were... We were together, we were organized, and we made a great album. And then Jimmy came to me and said, we have a problem, Stevie. We made a great album, but you don't have a single. And I'm like, seriously? We don't have a single, and you didn't tell me until now? And he goes, well, I thought it would work out. I thought one would come into my head, and, and it didn't. And so, but I have a plan. Tom Petty says, you can have Stop Dragging My Heart Around. It's already recorded. He, he'll sing it with you. And problem solved. And I finally got to meet Tom Petty. <laughs> Who 
Well, Jimmy had kept me a secret from because he didn't want Tom to get pissed off and think that his, like, his, his, uh, his attention was going to be taken away because he had a new girlfriend. <laughs> so I like him in the basement. It was fine. I got to hear everything. Eavesdrop all through it. So anyway, Jimmy, Doug, Paul, Danny, also Irving me off because I had to hire him in 1976 because my mother said, you better get some help here because you don't have anybody taking care of your money. So I hired Irving, who gladly said, sure, I'll do it. Not having any idea that he'd still be sitting here tonight going like, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> My press agent, Liz Rosenberg, who I met in 1976, who is still present, press agenting for me. And she's the best. She's the, the Rona Bear of the, today. And I adore her. And she's elegant and incredible. So talk to her if you can. She'll get you in the newspaper. And then there was Howard Kaufman, who passed away a little while ago, who then became my manager when Irving had to go become the president of a record company. And that was okay, because we all have to branch out. And um, let's see, Ed Cheryl, who when Howard passed away, then took on the mantle of being my manager, which is no easy thing. Because I don't agree with anything anybody said. Especially when it's a girl. But thank you, Cheryl, for giving it your all. Anyway, you all have been a fantastic, fantastic audience and a wonderful <laughs> you a keynote speaker, somebody to talk to, someone to talk to a group of people, I am your girl. <laughs>